I have said that there was nothing in my life when I was young but oysters. But that is not quite true. I had friends and cousins, as any girl must have who grows up in a small town in a large old family. I had my sister Alice, my dearest friend of all, with whom I shared a bedroom and a bed, and who heard all my secrets and told me all of hers. I even had a kind of beau, a boy named Freddy, who worked a dredging smack beside my brother Davy and my uncle Joe on Whitstable Bay. And, last of all, I had a fondness, you might say, a kind of passion for the music hall, and more particularly for music hall songs and the singing of them. If you have visited Whitstable, you will know that this was a rather inconvenient passion, for the town has neither music hall nor theatre, only a solitary lamppost before the Duke of Cumberland Hotel, where minstrel troops occasionally sing and the Punch and Judy man in August sets his booth. But Whitstable is only 15 minutes away by train from Canterbury, and here there was a music hall. The Canterbury Palace of Varieties, where the shows were three hours long and the tickets cost sixpence and the acts were the best to be seen, they said, in all of Kent. The palace was a small and, I suspect, a rather shabby theatre, but when I see it in my memories, I see it still with my oyster girl's eyes. I see the mirror glass which lined the walls, the crimson plush upon the seats, the plaster cupids, painted gold, which swooped above the curtain. Like our oyster house, it had its own particular scent. The scent, I know now, of music halls everywhere. The scent of wood and grease paint and spilling beer, of gas and of tobacco and of hair oil, all combined. It was a scent which as a girl I loved uncritically. Later I heard it described by theatre managers and artists as the smell of laughter, the very odour of applause. Later still, I came to know it as the essence, not of pleasure, but of grief. That, however, is to get ahead of my story. I was more intimate than most girls with the colours and scents of the Canterbury Palace, in the period, at least, of which I am thinking, that final summer in my father's house when I became 18, because Alice had a beau who worked there, a boy named Tony Reeves, who got a seats at knockdown prices or for free. Tony was the nephew of the palace's manager, the celebrated Tricky Reeves, and therefore something of a catch for our Alice. My parents mistrusted him at first, thinking him rapid because he worked in a theatre and wore cigars behind his ears and talked glibly of contracts, London and champagne. But no one could dislike Tony for long. He was so large-hearted and easy and good, and like every other boy who courted her, he adored my sister and was ready to be kind to us all on her account. Thus it was that Alice and I were so frequently to be found on a Saturday night, tucking our skirts beneath our seats and calling out the choruses to the gayest songs in the best and most popular shows at the Canterbury Palace. Like the rest of the audience, we were discriminating. We had our favourite turns. Artists we watched and shouted for, Songs we begged to have sung and re-sung again and again until the singer's throat was dry. And she, for more often than not, it was the lady singers whom Alice and I loved best, could sing no more but only smile and curtsy. And when the show was over and we had paid our respects to Tony in his stuffy little office behind the ticket seller's booth, we would carry the tunes away with us. We would sing them on the train to Whitstable and sometimes others, returning home from the same show, as merry as we, would sing them with us. We would whisper them into the darkness as we lay in bed. We would dream our dreams to the beat of their verses, and we would wake next morning humming them still. We'd serve a bit of music hall glamour then with our fish suppers. Alice whistling as she carried platters and making the customers smile to hear her. Me perched on my high stool beside my bowl of brine, singing to the oysters that I scrubbed and prized and bearded. 
Mother said I should be on the stage myself. When she said it, however, she laughed, and so did I. The girls I saw in the glow of the footlights, the girls whose songs I loved to learn and sing, they weren't like me. They were more like my sister. They had cherry lips and curls that danced about their shoulders. They had bosoms that jutted and elbows that dimpled and ankles, when they showed them, as slim and as shapely as beer bottles. I was tall and rather lean. My chest was flat, my hair dull, my eyes a drab and an uncertain blue. My complexion, to be sure, was perfectly smooth and clear, and my teeth were very white. But these, in our family at least, were counted unremarkable, for since we all passed our days in a miasma of simmering brine, we were all as bleached and blemishless as cuttlefish. No, girls like Alice were meant to dance upon a gilded stage, skirted in satin, hailed by cupids, and girls like me were made to sit in the gallery, dark and anonymous, and watch them. Or, so anyway, I thought then.